All righty. Welcome, everybody, to Otter Talk number 13. This is our very first weekend Otter Talk, and we've had people requesting weekend Otter Talk, so hopefully um, everybody's happy about that. I know a lot of our West Coast people are. Um, today's Otter Talk is Everyday Grooming Care and Maintenance of Your Otter Hound, and Bev Beeren has been nice enough and generous enough to donate her time and knowledge with us today. Bev is a long-term breeder of otter towns. I think she's had like 20 litters of otter hounds and she's very helpful. She is the breeder of our otter hound, Ellie, and she's been very, very helpful coming from um, a totally different breed. She's been very helpful for us in uh, telling us what to do and how to do it. So uh, she's gonna share that information with all of us today. So thank you for coming and Bev, uh, I'm going to start by having you tell us a little bit about you, and then we'll get started with the presentation after that. Awesome. Okay, so first of all, I want to let you know I'm Bev Buren. That's my maiden name, and my married name is Bev Yanover, just in case some newbies don't know the difference. Um, when I got married, I said, okay, I'll change the dogs, and then Canadian Kennel Club wanted my marriage license, and I said, screw you guys. So I kept my name, my dogs in Biren, and that's advantage because it stays at the top of the alphabet. <laughs> okay, so my background, um, I got my first otter hound in the late 70s. It was Adelaide of Linus from British Columbia, and the second one was Nordmark's dog, and I got him from California from the Petersons. My third, my foundation, Rin Jan's Jovial Jean from Jan. Farinon in Vermont, and yes, I drove down to pick that one up. I was on to on on my way down to a nationals for the Israeli Canaans, and my fourth was Tar Beach Cat and Perkins from Tom St. John and Tom Corbett. So that's where I started. My first litter was in 1982, and I've gone since then. Now my background on grooming, um, I was given a Westie to groom, and uh, basic how to pull the hair out, how to rotate the coat and work the coat. And I groomed and showed many group winning Westies. And I also showed and groomed several English Springer Spaniels. So I've covered quite a few different coats um, throughout the 40, 40, 40 years, sorry. <laughs> I'm aging myself. Okay, so our coat is hard. It is not coarse like a terrier. And our coat is basically the same as a wolfhound or a spinoni, the wire haired pointing grip on and the burger per card, okay? They're hard. They're not showing in a terrier type fully stripped down. Well, maybe the wolfhound is now. Um, <clears throat> they're shown with more coat. Um, you also know a terrier um, groomer because you'll see them continually plucking coat by ringside too. Um, let's see. So to me, a healthy coat, a hard coat and a healthy coat is a coat that is rotated. Um, we don't have golden coats. We don't have the soft coats that sometimes you just have to shave down. Most important is that you remove the dead coat so the new coat can come in. And a rule of thumb is you always groom the dog or groom in the direction you want the way it to grow. Okay, so basically we're just gonna talk about maintenance of coat. Um, and I can tell you, I brought my few things and my main utensil is the Greyhound comb. Oh, what do you know, I don't even have one. Wire comb. <laughs> I prefer, see there's several kinds of wire combs out there. But I, uh, can everybody see that? Everybody? Uh, I prefer the Greyhound. It's just a little bit different and, and it's just easier. And the idea is to get the undercoat out continue, and continually rotating it. Now before I show you how with my little demo dog. Um, I just want to tell you one story where somebody came out west, brought their otter helm, we we're going to compete, and the dog just stunk. And she was told, 
oh, more undercoat, more undercoat. Uh, that's what the judges told her. So she went to return her car. Two of us worked on this dog. Took us two hours, layer combed, combed out all that. And when she came home, the dog no longer stunk. The undercoat was matted. And that's what smelled because it wasn't pulled out and rotated. Okay, so we worked this out earlier. Do you like my dog? It's a really bad beanie baby collie. So basically when you're talking about rotating coat, you want to layer. So you want to pull all this hair forward and you want to comb it. Okay. And if the, the narrow, the thinner area doesn't really get it out, you can always start with something like this, the wire tooth, the, the wire, the bigger ones, or work with this one and work it out. It is important to do this whole dog over and over again. Um, I do mine. Any questions on that? No? Cool. Yay. Good dog. Um, I do mine. Um, a pet coat, maybe twice a month, three times a month. It depends how much coat they have. If they have lots of undercoat, you really want to work it. You may want to work it more in the spring and the fall when they tend to shed more. But that's usually the coat that's mainly found around the house and it needs to come out. Yes. I have a question, Bev. So you start at the tail, then do you, do you work all the way up to the neck and then down the body and the legs or where do you go from where you were just showing us on your collie? Yes, I usually, that's where I start. And I don't request, require my dog to stand through that whole procedure. It's easy to sit. So I'll start at the base of the tail and I'll work up to the neck, up to the head, and then I'll work down the sides, work down the legs. And of course, the, the chest area is uh, has got lots of coat and undercoat that also needs to be raked under the neck, under the ears. The ears too all need to be the whole dog. Just the more undercoat you can pull out, um, and the more often you can do it, um, the less hair you have around the house, and the more opportunity you have for a healthy coat to grow in. Okay. I have a quick question, Bev. Do you so so you 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 do you you show the comb? Do you ever use rake or a brush? No. Uh, oh, here's my greyhound. See, it's well used. No, I basically this is all I use. Okay. Um, I've tried the rake and I found it it broke the top coat. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to break the top coat. You want to rotate and pull the top coat up. Okay. Um, yeah, this is it for shows at the dog show, any place else. All I basically take is a greyhound comb and just get the undercoat out. When you pull out the undercoat, you're also pulling out some of the top coat as well. So you're kind of rotating your top coat as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? So basically all I use. Um, if you want, Christy has a question, but Christy, you are on mute. Who has a question? <laughs> Christy. Oh, there she goes. So, what about, um, I don't know, my dog in the area where we live, she gets lots of bears attached to her. <laughs> and, and so, you know, then they just go at the grass seat. I can see Ivan also has the same thing. Like then, and those grass seeds just create a, a clotted knot. How would you deal with that? Are you showing the dog at all? No. No. Well, just cut it out. Really? Just cut it out. I mean, it's a lot easier on the dog. And yeah. then, and then take your greyhound comb and comb out the hair as well. But yeah, that's that's the natural way. If you don't like think stripping or pulling out dead hair is good enough, then do what she does. <laughs> just, <laughs> then, just cut it. Yeah, just cut it out. There are, um, let me see, I have scissors here. I have two kinds of scissors. When you're cutting out hair and you don't want to cut it right off, 
you want to go down in the direction and cut, okay? Okay. And that way you're cutting through the mat, through the burrs, and you're still saving some of the coat. Okay. okay. Yay, good dog. <laughs> okay, another way to pull out undercoat is the taze or thinning shears, okay? No, we're not cutting. <laughs> what you want to do, okay, what you want to do is comb. Can you see? And what you're going to do is that thinning shear, the serrated part, will also help pull out undercoat. So once you've got the dog combed so you got most of the mats out, you can just take thinning shears and you can comb down through it. And that will help take out undercoat. Okay? Okay, any more questions? Let's see what my undercoat is saying. I did make notes. Okay, any questions, any comments? Oh, cool. Eileen had a comment. She said that um, she has a lot of burrs when she tracks and she uses the wide to still comb and that works wonders. Absolutely. Yeah, that works too. It'll get through it. Any matted coats will always get through. This comb will help get through it. But I don't like using any of those others that cut the coat. I use combs only on my other breed as well. And even on the big, stiff, hard mats, if you start on the outside of the mat, like with the one tooth of the comb and work from the outside into the mat, you can get out pretty much anything with those two combs. And, and the other thing you can think of doing is when you're combing out mats, lost my comb. Here's one. If you stick your fingers between the dog's coat, and the comb and break up the mat, then you're not pulling on the dog. And it makes it a little bit easier. And you know what, first couple times you work the coat, it takes time to go through it. It's not something that you can do. If you do it every other day, you could get through it in half an hour, depending on the type of coat, the size of dog, okay? I have five dogs here and I have five different types of coats. Okay. Um, and if anybody, stripping knives, the coarse one, it also works like you're serrated and it pulls out under coat. You just have to remember how to, you don't want to dig into the dog's coat or into their skin. You just want to just rake it down the coat and you'll find it'll pull out coat. Okay, that's it on under coat. A hey, question, yes. Oh, I'm not sure I've never heard of a, a stripping knife. Don't worry, about it. Don't worry about it. Grab a pair of thinning shears. I have some of them. Use that to rake out undercoat. Okay. Oh, uh, you. you see, you can see the difference. You'll get more out with the thinning shears than you would with the stripping knife. Thank you. Any time. This is fun. <laughs> I'm enjoying this. Okay, any more undercoat question? It's important to get it out to get the coat rotated. Uh, okay, I'm seeing some of the questions on the side. Okay, we can always go back if any questions come up again. Okay, okay, now we're talking about the top coat, the hard coat, not the wire coat, the hard coat. Uh, and you can ruin the top coat by clippering the dog. Okay. Um, I got one, his top coat was clippered. It took me a year to get that coat back in by just continually rotating and pulling. Um, if you don't like pulling out the top coat, then you just send it into the bushes with thistles, burrs, bring it back, start pulling out those burrs and you're going to start pulling out that top coat. I would rather say, let's not do that. Let's just pull the top coat out. Um, it can be tedious uh, because you only pull like four or five hairs at a time. Uh, okay, back to Collie. So I find the best way to do the top coat 
is spike the hair and then just pull the long hairs. You're only gonna pull maybe four or five hairs at a time. Got it? Any questions? Any comments? So a good example is if you look at your dog's tail, it's got two different lengths. You got the dry flyaway, longer hair, and then, and then you have the newer coat that's trying to grow in, but it can't because there's too much dry flyaway dead hair. And that's on your head, your legs, everywhere you'll find uh, the dead coat. So my recommendation is to keep the dog in a good rotating coat. I would strongly recommend that you continually pull out. And like I said, you're not pulling any more than four or five hairs at a time. You spike it and you pull out the top, the longest hairs, the dry fly away, and it does not bother the dog at all. Okay. And that's fun to work over the whole body. Again, you always pull the coat for the people that like to show their dogs, you always pull in the direction you want the coat to grow. So if you want a nice top line, you, you pull it towards the tail. Okay. Um, undercoat also, like uh, Robin knows, if you remove a lot of that dead undercoat, your top line pop, your hair on the top coat uh, sits nicer and you have a coarser coat. And, and that's really, if you don't like your top coat, if you pull up the undercoat, then you have a better top coat. Don't ask why. It works. It works. Uh, any questions? Oh, I'm good. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Puppy coat. I have a question. Shoot. Uh, it's Franz. Why you, you, I'm sorry, my English is not very good. Why you, you, you pull the hair on the top? Why, why are you doing that? You know, you, you mentioned that you just took some hair out of the coat a little bit. Yes. Why do you do that? that? The, that is dry, fluffy, dead coat. So we have a hard And how do you see it? How do you do it? How, how do you see if it's a dead coat or You'll not? See you will see the difference. When you spike the dog up, you will okay. see two lengths of coat. Yeah. The, 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 he the okay. healthy. The healthy bottom isn't healthy coat isn't as long, but the uh, dry coat is longer. That is a dead coat. Oh, okay. 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 Thank you. Anytime. We're here. I I um I love doing this. I really love doing this. Um. Okay. So, any more question on comments on the top coat removing it? Question: How long does it take you to go through the whole dog doing that uh the undercoat or the top coat the top coat uh a long time but you're not doing it all the time like when i had my westie um and i did not have a stripping knife um i would sit watching tv okay and pull out the coat it doesn't hurt them because it's all dead coat okay so um it it takes you know to do the whole dog it takes a while and then once you have it that you have a really nice coat it's just a continual oh i'll strip a few or oh, strip i don't like using that word i'll pull some hairs here i'll pull some hairs there and it's easy to see the dead coat that needs to be rotated okay, okay. and the dogs will sit still for this because i have a nine month old puppy and it's like wrestling a bear to get him to stay even to to brush him he just you know, and we're treating and we're talking nice. And it's like, we've been doing this, brushing him with some kind of a brush or comb almost every day since we've got him. And he still has not relinquished the fact that he does not like this and it has to sit still. Oh, that's okay. I have a three-year-old that does the same thing. Um, you don't need to do it. Um, I, I like to do it on the floor. Okay. Uh, watching TV, getting them to relax, scratching their belly, pulling some coat out. Okay. Say that same thing. They don't have to be standing on a grooming table to do any of this. Right. Uh, you can be sitting next to them. You can be, you know, you can do a couple hairs while you're, you know, rolling their ball back and forth. And you can kind of get creative 
with getting your dog to cooperate and not let him think he's cooperating. <laughs> I, I get the nine months old. I was going to talk a little bit more about puppy coat next. Okay, as we all know, question, go. No, it's a suggestion maybe, even though I'm no expert. You know that time in the morning, Marie, where that puppy's just staring into your face on the bed? <laughs> right eye up. Maybe then just have a few little cooks. Because <laughs> that's what mine does. She's right there. Eye contact. <laughs> I got it. You know what? I, I, like I did with the Westie, I would do it while watching TV. Or I would do with my otter hound sitting on the floor or outside throwing a ball. If they break the ball back, I might grab a few hairs if they take off again. They don't feel it, it doesn't bother them, but I can understand a nine month old puppy. Okay, um, now with puppies, we always know mo all breeds pretty well go through a change of coat. Um, the one thing I've always noted was that the head is the, the coat that uh, it goes first and is, it takes the longest to uh, grow back in. So when I, before I sent all my puppies off to their homes between eight and 12 weeks, I used to pull most of the, the dead hair out of the, the head and the uh, head would come in, they would come in with a really nice coat. And so again, with a puppy coat, just keep working it, keep combing. If you see longer hairs, pull them out um, and just have fun with it. It shouldn't hurt, it should be fun. And I get it. <laughs> Bev, when does, when do a, does a puppy otter hound start developing undercoat? Do they start from really young or does it start coming in later? Oh, I don't know. I, I don't know, I just start combing them when I, I don't know, <laughs> you got me on that one. I'm curious because like, with our other breed black Russians, they don't start developing an undercoat until really their adult coat starts coming in. So I would say on a black Russian, which is not an underhound at all, um, it doesn't even start until like 10 months old or so, depending on the dog. So I'm just curious. Um, I don't remember Ellie having undercoat right away, but I don't remember when hers started either. But I remember, so, and with any puppy, going from a puppy to a dog, there's not as much to do as they're a puppy. So you can gradually get them used to doing it for longer and longer too. If you start when they're a baby, there's not a whole lot to start with typically. That's right. That's right. Just, um, just work, start working their coat when they're young. You can see the dead coat. You can start working and rotating their coat as young dogs at three, four or five months old. Um, hey. I have one puppy otter hound common. So with my litters, I, coat wise, I would divide them in two categories. Some of them have this, have this coarser, shorter kind of coat that's very nice and very easy. And then you have the monkeys. And the monkey is your fuzzy puppy with the hairs over here. And it's like this puffy puffball kind of thing. And those tend to have a softer coat with undercoat coming in much faster or perhaps that soft coat being just pain in the butt. So those softer, fuzzier dogs, I always coach my owners to start uh, doing the comb uh, and brushing them and getting the dead, soft, soft puppy hair out sooner than later because they will have a heavier coat as they grow. So, and, and that coat will mat much faster as they grow. And again, I, just like Ben, I have, right now I only have three, which is the first time in 10 years that I only have three otter hounds. So I feel like nothing, um, but these softer coats will mat longer, I mean faster, and it will take you longer to groom them so the sooner you start the dog used to the going through the coat, pulling and combing, the easier it's going to be over their time. So that's my, and I don't know, um, Robin, if this is undercoat, it's just that there's this overall fluff everywhere. Yeah, good point. And, and with our dogs, it's never the top coat really that's matting. It's always like the undercoat from the skin outward. Yes. So like you can feel them and they don't feel matted on the top, but then if yes. you put your fingers into their fur, mm -hmm. Added at the base. Yep. 
it's the same same experience with with my otter hounds. I, I have a couple of those that if you go on the top or with just a brush, you go, oh, that's easy. But then you put a comb in and it's a disaster. Yeah, get, getting the undercoat out means you usually don't have to bath them as often because they just don't smell. Um, I get mine on the table and finish grooming and I go, oh, they don't smell like they get, <laughs> they're not getting a bath for a while. And I haven't bathed mine for six or seven months. And different dogs within the breed have different amounts of undercoat too, I've noticed. Yeah. Some yeah. have tons and some have little. So it varies from dog to dog within the breed. And the same with the top coat, it varies from dog to dog. You cannot get more top coat and you cannot get longer length by pulling out coat. It's whatever the dog has and you just rotate whatever they have. Okay, how are we doing? Any more questions, comments? Thanks Ashka, that's so true. Doing great. Uh, we talked puppy coat. Any more puppy coat questions in there from the people that have young dogs? It takes time, and again, you don't have to do it on a table. You can do it on the floor. Um, okay, I, I, beards. <laughs> um, beards, dogs don't like their beards comb, and we find that sometimes they mat because of the food and the water. Um, I've always, and then under the chest and the under the ears, they get a thicker coat. Um, I've always um trimmed right inside their mouth okay so i'm going to use me as an example because it's my dogs don't open their mouth so what i do is when you pull back and right on the lip line you'll see it's wet gungy full of food i take scissors and i just cut it out it doesn't affect their beard and all it does is help to prevent the smell and keeps their beard cleaner. Okay, anybody have questions on that? I, I do have a comment about general beard maintenance, um, which is the key is to keep it clean and relatively dry. And what I mean by that, that no matter what they eat and drink, it's always gonna have that little slimy thing. So for me, if it gets too slimy, uh, and, and I apologize, I'm in California and I have a hose outside year round, <laughs> right? But I will take a little bit Dawn liquid and just do this job, let it dry and brush it. And if you brush it regularly, it's not gonna get too, if it gets gooey, it gets dreadlocks. But if you get the goo out with the Dawn liquid, right? it will just not stick together and it will not form the dreadlocks, which means it will smell less and it will be easy to brush. So yes. that's, that's my latest invention. And I do use scissors, especially in the middle. So because I show my dogs, I can't, I don't want to do too much trimming or too much drastic trimming, but it seems to me that right in the middle here, it gets most goo. So I would just trim here and just like Bev said, around the lip line. So they still have a beard, but it's relatively clean. So that's my beard protocol. Yeah, she lives in California. She should come up here. <laughs> no way. Thank you. Yeah, I know you've, you've been here. Yeah, yeah, sure. I can't even get across the border. Um, always and if you have the beards and you find that they um, are getting matted then what you want to do is take the scissors here's the coat and you want to go through the beard like this okay and that'll break down the mats without really taking out the coat and making it easier for you to groom and always consider using the wider comb when you're using the beard they seem to get a lot more hair underneath their ears and down through their chest and it's just constant maintenance on them. You can use a wider comb all the time on them. Okay, so we all can have nice clean beards now, hey? I have a... Oh, uh, Marie, you've, you've put yourself on mute. There we go. Oops, there. Yeah. Um, 
does does can you hear me yes okay does the dawn take out the brown yucky stains in the beard i've been mm -hmm. trying like dog shampoo like whitening dawn shampoo liquid. dawn liquid well, okay. like, you know, if you think about it, just like the commercial says, the oiled covered little duckling. Right. If it can do this, it can do the beard. Gotcha. And it's really not irritating. I mean, Dawn Liquid is like my latest invention, and I'm like so dumb that I didn't find it before. Okay. Um, but just a little bit. So I just do like a little, little dot on my hand. I right. put a little water and then I just go like this and then I hose it down. And unfortunately, or fortunately for me, I'm in California that that hose is out there all the time, but you can do it in the shower. Um, and, and I mean, but the key is that I let the beard dry before I brush it. Okay. Because dry and, and I don't know if you guys notice it that after bath, it's always easier to take out all the mats. Right. Right. But it has to be dry because if it's if it's wet, it still pulls too much. Okay. But Dawn Liquid, I swear by okay. it. Thank you. I, thank you. I, I didn't know that either. I usually don't use any dish detergent. I, I like Chris Coat. That's the only one I use. I've tried others, but some of them smell and I can't stand the perfume. So I just stick with Chris Coat uh, at a dog show instead of using a whitening. I'll just go bath or beard. It just gets them cleaner. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I Dawn, I'm sorry, I use Dawn only for beards. Yes, right. don't don't put it on the rest of your coat, it'll soften right. the coat. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Ashka, thanks for joining because I'm learning lots too. <laughs> okay, um, ears is the next one. Um, I do have a floppy ear dog, it's a beanie baby. Like them? Okay, so he just doesn't have a lot of coat. So I learned this from a, a non-dog show person as a way to help circulate the hair or the ears. And where's my scissors? And one of them is I will take clippers and I will clip the inside of the ear. And that will just keep it clean, prevent it from smelling and and help the ear. The other thing I would do is I will take scissors and I will scissor this area here in the ear. Got it? Kind of? And what that does is takes away the hair and it allows more air to get in and help keep it. You're not taking much, you're just taking just on the, uh, just inside the ear, okay? Um, so Bev, is it in like is it inside the ear or is it on the just the outside? No, it's in this area right here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you ever pluck their ears, Bev? Uh, yeah, sometimes. They're really full of fur. I I'm lucky mine aren't. <laughs> I've not seen one that had a lot of fur in, inside their ears either, but I was just curious. If okay, so so that is that is I, I apologize. Another adventure of mine that I do have a dog that's a freak of nature, and she produces so much hair inside her ear that after years of fighting, uh, I started taking her to the vet, and she gets her hair pulled out every couple of months because otherwise the gunk, the hair will hold the gunk, you will never wash it with the purple solution because purple solution is not gonna make it. And that means that the smell comes on and the infections come on. And I've seen on Facebook that someone said that plucking out ears is not gonna prevent infections. Not true in, in the case of my dog that literally, if we don't pull the hair in like three, maybe four months, we pull out a dreadlock that long out of the ear canal, so. Okay, another thing, uh, chalk. You can buy chalk oh, yeah. for the- I did that to my dogs. I, pardon? You yeah. did that to my dogs, it worked. Um, the, if you put some, you can buy it by the bottle or you, you know, there's chalk specifically for the ears. 
you spray a little bit in the ears, it, what it does is help you grab the, the hair in the ears and pull it out and it doesn't hurt as much as grabbing it without it, okay? So some, the chalk just gives you a better uh, uh, grip at the ears and you can pull the hair out that way. They also have at your powder for that same usage too. It's in a little tiny bottle with a little tiny nozzle that you can sprinkle enough in there just to be able to give it some, uh, where you can grab it and pluck it. And, and they don't usually mind that if, um, oftentimes if you do it when starting from their, when they're puppies, if you have a dog with fur inside their ears, they like it. I know I have dogs that love it and they just groan like, oh my gosh, thank you so much every time I do it. So um, don't be afraid to pluck it if you need to or use some ear powder or chalk to, to give you some, some pull. Hemostats work also. Um, just have to be careful that you're not pulling too big of a chunk out at a time because that tends to hurt. Just be careful not to just grab a little bit at a time. And, and you can get chalk, the, the ear powder at pet stores. Or yeah. even cornstarch will work. Okay. Uh, I, I think it's, it's the greatest thing to pull out some of the, the hair from the ears. Okay, so basically uh, clippering the inside of the ear and cutting some of the uh, area just below the ear canal will help. And if they don't have much ear hair at all, like if you can see their ear canal easily, when you lift up their ear, you can see right down to the canal, then they might not need much of maintenance. Ever. You can tell by looking inside their ear whether they need uh, work on their ear or, or hair removed just by whether or not you can see down the canal. I mean, I've had dogs that get um, mats way low in the ear and you don't see it right away. I use the hemostat to pull that out because I can't get my fingers in far enough. They don't have any problem with it. And it's amazing. The hairiest ears in my dogs have been in the shortest, hardest coat. So um, some have no hair, but it can be way down. And that's when I do the hemostat because sometimes it's not infected. It's not even dirty, but it, there is a mat of hair in there. I personally have no courage to put the hemostat inside the ear. <laughs> That's why I take my dog to the vet because I also don't trust a groomer to stick anything inside because they can hurt the dog. They so grab, I would they say skin, if yeah. you do, talk to your vet to show you what you what you do or you know if the dog doesn't have a problem you reaching. But I'm saying if you if you don't know or you're not confident, I'm always on the side of caution and I have no problem, you know getting my vet to do it for me a couple of times and look if I have, if I can do it, I still can't. So did I, when I was there, did I get yours out decently? Was yeah, you did a good job, but that was you. That wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I'm just not, not me. I do everything for my dog except for ears and the rear side of the anatomy, but. So I can come back anytime and visit? Huh? I can come back and visit anytime. Yes, anytime. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, when using a groomer. Mm. Any concerns? I groom my own dogs. Uh, I don't send mine to a groomer. Um, the only thing I would do if you're sending your dog to a groomer is maybe they bath the dog with warm water and they blow out the undercoat <laughs> and they comb the dog out first make sure they're not matted but i wouldn't send my, i wouldn't have that hard coat clippered it it hurts the coat it's not the best for a hard coat and you're not getting the undercoat out which is most important that's what causes the smell okay i also have eyes not all of us show our dogs and not all of us and some of our dogs want to see where they're going um, but we want to keep the hair over the eyes right so what i do okay i have griffin that's almost 12 years old what i've done with just 
I just cut the hair around her eyes. But some of us like to keep the little bit of hair. So what I recommend you do is on the nose here, down through the eye, just trim that hair there. This way you're keeping all the eyebrow, but you're just taking some of the hairs out um, in this area of their eyes and that they can see better that way. Does that make sense? Any questions, comments? And then I have some that just don't have any hair. I have a question about eyes. Um, the boogers in their eyes, how do you keep those clean? Eyes, uh, take them out. Yeah. I get them myself. Ooh, I have a recommendation. Okay. Um, a, uh, a lice comb, so like a flea and lice comb. Uh, it has very, very close tines and it usually comes, it kind of looks like the, uh, the stripper comb, except, you know, obviously combs are blunted. Um, and with Jojo, you know, occasionally she'll get one like gnarled in there and it just glides it right out. You know, it's, it doesn't get too close to her eye and it's really, really good for keeping it nice and clean. What causes them? Um, yeah, it's, it's from what I understand, it's just, you know, it, it's like our sleepy eye, essentially. Every time we wake up and, you know, you have to go like this a little bit in the morning. Um, Bev, you, you had a little bit of veterinary experience. What do you think? I don't know. I just think of it as sleepy eye and it's just discharge and it's not there. If it's, if there's a lot, then maybe you might have a concern, but if just got a little bit there, I wouldn't worry about it. The hair can, sometimes the hair can aggravate and that's why I like to cut the hair away. I think it's the hair that irritates it. I had a little eye adventures lately. So, so a couple of, you know, um, um, things that I experimented with is I use the eye wash or you can make a, your own saline solution. But if you have like one of the eye, even the human eye wash or warm water, just lukewarm water, flush the eyes to keep them clean. And it tends to help with my dogs who had significant or significant more discharge than I would like. And if you just, I have a, like a bottle with that you can, I can spray mm -hmm. right, the eye and I just go and I wipe it with the paper towel and it, and it tends to reduce the number of discharge in the following few days. So if you just flush it a couple of times a week and see if it helps, because it could be like dust or dirt or, you know, when the, when the head is down and the nose is down, maybe just the dirt gets in the eye and then the eye needs to clean itself so you have a heavy discharge. This is a product that I use um, for Gable who has a lot of discharge in his eyes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's called Optics Care. Mm -hmm. And I've taken, I've, I've taken him to an eye specialist and um, I can't even begin to tell you how much she charged me for the first package. And then <laughs> pandemic started and I found it on, um, on Amazon and it's like $11 a pack. Um, what is it again? It's called Optics Care, O-P-T-I-X-C-A-R-E. And he gets a lot of those eye boogers and I just, I, I flick them off with my fingers, but then I clean around the eye with, these are uh, lubricated little uh, sheets. Don't throw them down the toilet though. They, they should not be flushed. Make sure you throw them away. Um, and then clean clean the hair around the eyes, and he loves it. He finds it very soothing. Um, and there's it's it's gentle, and it's it's not um, it's not an antiseptic, but it definitely does have some cleansing property to it. Do you scissor do you scissor some of the hair away from the eyes as well? Uh, uh, over the veil. He has. If, if you know my dog, you know how much hair he has. I do. So, I try to thin now that I'm not showing him anymore. I'm thinning. I'm thinning the veil out a little bit. Um, um, he's not walking into as many walls either. So. <laughs> yeah. Try try the, the the try the cutting from the nose down through the eye. Tear. Try take, take, taking some of that hair out too, and you might find yeah. a little bit better. Okay. 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 Um, so have I covered all the questions people wrote in? Getting. So we have nails left. That was um, oh. one of the questions that we had on the email is the dremeling and how to get them used to it. Um, so when you get to nails, 
that's um, that's that's all I have left to talk about uh, unless there are any other questions I just I just want to comment on dogs that are in the show ring as opposed to the pet dogs um, I basically talked about how to keep your dog groomed mm -hmm. um, these show dogs and my show dogs um, I just basically comb them out more often and and work their coat and I don't need to do anything else that's special to go in the show ring. So if you want, if you feel you want to show it just, a show dog would be groomed three, four or five times a week. Each time they go in the ring, they'll be combed out. Where us pet people may only comb twice or three times a month. So there's a big difference in how much a show dog is groomed compared to our pet dogs. And that's, one of the differences when you see a, a dog in the ring and their coat looks nice and flat is probably because they were groomed three times. And, and I also found if I can really groom that undercoat out two or three days before a show, the work is minimal at a dog show. It may be 20 minutes to comb them out before they go in the ring. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's basically the difference between or you know there's some of the show dogs out there and some of our pets that look a lot hairier than the other dogs uh, uh bev uh yeah. we have a question how would do you have any recommendations uh for how to groom between the paw pads oh i use scissors um i use scissors or clippers and i will clipper them out mm -hmm. i before i clipper though i make sure there are no mats and uh, otherwise I will scissor and you have to be really careful if there's a mat in there and you try and scissor them out just be careful okay um and talk about nails nails are something personal um before my puppies left I was dremeling them and they were used to the dremel when they left the house here what happens after that I don't know what they do <laughs> <laughs> um, I prefer the Dremel over the the, uh, the nail clippers. Um, nail clippers, you can clip too much, and if they start bleeding, bleeding them and it hurts, the dogs are more sensitive to having their nails done. Um, when I Dremel, they're either on the ground, laying on the floor, laying on my bed, um, rarely on the table, grooming table, and uh, a couple of them just like to be stood and you pick them up like you pick up a horse's foot and you do each foot that way. And then they all get a cookie after they get their nails done. So, you know, it's how you work it um, as opposed to um, how the dog likes it. My grandma is charged up so I don't have a cord and I can follow them around the house. <laughs> uh, do you have any recommendations for the types of bits or heads to use? I don't know. I use a coarse one. The sandpaper head. Yeah, that works. Not the metal one, it's just the sandpaper rotating head where you can replace the little sandpaper mm -hmm. cylinder. That's all I've ever seen in the stores. Uh, I, I do know that there is a variant uh, that we use. It's it's diamond head Dremels. It's a little right. bit more pricey, but they don't heat up, and you you don't have to replace them like ever. Okay, I agree. I like those as well. And we also we use have used an electric one, but make sure if you do an electric one, you do a dog electric one that will stop if you get fur in it. Um, Otter hounds don't have a lot of fur around their nails, so it's a little bit easier. But with a dog one, it'll stop rotating if it gets fur. Whereas a like electric one like your husband might have in his toolbox, it's gonna keep spinning if it catches hair. Okay, I just ordered the cordless dog one. And I know it comes with a couple of the tips or heads, whatever you call them. And I have seen people recommend the, is it the diamond one? So I figure I'll just get him used to the Dremel and see if you know, and clipping nails has been a real challenge. My Dremel, my Dremel is a 7300. I got it from, okay. I, I've seen it in, in the hardware stores. Right. I think the difference is the dog ones have kind of a, a cover over it to protect a little bit. Yeah. I know it can be taken off. They said it's basically the same one. 
Great. You know, if I could say a word, be careful if you have long hair, don't bend too close to the Dremel. <laughs> I've had I think from experience. Tie it. your hair back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got that. Oh, yeah, good point. I also have one more suggestion, which is because otter hounds are big dogs. When I first started playing with Dremels, I bought like this highly advertised um, Dremel with like one speed, and I would like get old and retired by the time one toenail was Dremeled because it was just so slow and so gentle that we were both like going, oh, I'm dying. So I, I, I recommend the one that had a couple of speeds because those will always have the higher speed that, you know, if you just need to do it quickly, um, you can adjust it. Don't, don't get, I mean, make sure that it is for a big dog, not a small dog, because it's, it's just not gonna work. Yes. Not to not to mention uh, with those multi speeds as well. If you're just introducing it to them, you know, obviously the slowest speed is going to be better. And as you both get more confident with it, then you can amp it up. Yeah, and on puppies too, you don't want to uh, use a higher one. That's just mm -hmm. to get them used to the noise and the slower speed is works up work up to them. Okay, mine doesn't. Mine won't. He won't let me go near him with his nails. It just it fights the whole thing. I, I, I think I might have to have him sedated to have his nails trimmed. So just what you want to do is start playing with his feet. You play with his feet, give him a treat. Play with his feet and play with each individual nail and then give him a treat. So he's used to you playing with the nails. And then you could introduce uh, a Dremel and give him a treat. Like have those treats there, keep him preoccupied with the treats and get him used to it. My old dog, I used to have to give one nail, one treat, one nail, one treat. <clears throat> now she has to wait. <laughs> and then, one nail, one treat works um, wonders on dogs that, that really hate it. And uh, sometimes you need to use a better, a higher value treat too. Sometimes a, a cheese stick works better than a, a dog treat where they know, wow, that's the only time I get a, a cheese stick is when I get my nails done and then they're anxious to have you do them rather than dreading it. That's been a helpful hint for us. Our, um, our home base grooming area uh, is in our basement back at home. And um, the dogs, every time you walk towards the door, they will fight you to get down the stairs because <laughs> they know that their nails are gonna get trimmed and that means cheese and sausage. So, <laughs> yep, same here, same here, yeah. Oh. But I think, Be uh, Bev, you had an excellent suggestion with playing with each toe individually for no reason at all. Meaning, uh, if you watch TV uh, and you play with the toe or two toes and walk away so the dog doesn't really associate negative with playing with the feet, you just say, I'm playing with the feet and then you get treated and then I walk away. And when you introduce Dremel, what I did, well, I don't do it anymore, but what I used to do is just to let the Dremel run on the table while I play with the feet and, and, and feed the dog. And then we just turn off the Dremel and, and go home. So they, they start not being bothered by the nose and you just gradually, you know, get closer. Yeah, that's what I did when I had puppies too. I started them on the, the Dremel. I, I preferred the Dremel over the, you know, how you use nail clippers to take the tips off because you don't take too much nail off when you use a Dremel as opposed to the nail clippers. Less chance of hitting the quick with a Dremel than with nail clippers. <clears throat> but it's noisy and some of the dogs are afraid of it. So it's just a matter of getting them used to it. They need to make a Dremel with a squeak. <laughs> no, a Dremel <laughs> that puts treats on it. A squeak. <laughs> <laughs> one that you can put peanut butter on yeah one side of it's just a treat and the other side you can use to do the nails great right. let's, let's, okay guys let's start a new business how to make a new dremel there you go <laughs> yay okay how are we doing any comments any questions between the paw pads Depends. i do have a question about grooming like their undercarriage like around their belly 
and for Igor, his boy parts, because the hair under there right now, he's only about a year and a half old and his hair is real, real soft and real feathery and it tends to get matted real easy. Cut it off, cut it or clipper it. Okay. But you only just want to clipper that the small area and you definitely want to clipper the area on the end of the penis because it just mm -hmm. keeps it cleaner. Right. Okay, you can't see it. It's hard to comb, it's hard to get to. Just have That's, it covered. I was gonna mention that the tips has that stomach under her stomach and inside of her legs is really fine and it'll get thin mats and everything on it also. And I find I use the mat buster and just slowly just go under because they, they can't stand it when you brush them because she'll bite me. So I, so I just kind of go with like the, the sharp mass, but mat buster until you can, until it all goes away and then brush it and it's fine. But that, that's kind of how I do a tip with her thin thing. But Creed, I just try, like you said, I trim, trim back as much as you can so that it's not all hangy and wet all the time. And, and when you comb it out, just make sure that you put your fingers next to the skin. Yeah. So you're yeah. not pulling on the skin when you pull out the mats. Right. With right. Ellie, we make it a pleasurable thing for her. We have her lay on her back and rub her belly while we're doing it. And she mm -hmm. thinks it's the best. So then you can get those little tiny ones that you can't see when you're trying to work underneath her. Um, but you can either comb them out or cut them out or whatever it, it takes to get those little tiny fine ones that are in that tender skin, like between her legs. And, yeah. 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 Absolutely. And then privates, I, I mean, of course, I'm in my dog's privates all the time. But I think that, that it matters not just for boys, but also for girls, because some girls can have a really long, elaborate ending to their girly parts, too. Yeah. And just so be careful as when long you cut, as you're yeah. careful, and I usually like cover, like, like on the inside, you got the girly part. On the outside, you got the hair sticking out. And you can just guard it before you get good at it, right? Because my dogs now know that it's coming, so I can I don't have to protect as much. But whenever I groom like my grand puppy, the puppy that doesn't live with me, and I have to groom and I don't know how the dog is gonna react, I always protect uh, with my hand not to clip it because nobody wants to be clipped in private. You can also do that with a comb by putting a comb between the yeah. part, yeah. Yeah. whether it's their penis or their testicles or their vulva or whatever, but a, put a comb there and then take a scissor and cut mm -hmm. between the comb and the dog. That way you don't have a chance of accidentally cutting something that you don't want to cut and that would really make the dog angry. Uh, there was actually a, uh, a, I guess, a trick of the trade that we learned at a dog show as well. Um, it sounds kind of odd, but uh, letter openers. Um, if you go to Staples, you can get a pack of them for like, like five for like $2. Um, the blade is usually uh, within it. So like, cause you can hold it and then, you know, go like that. So there's no real, there's a less amount of danger risk of like, you know, putting scissors to the soft underbelly of your dog, you know? Um, and I really love doing that because all you have to do is just hold it up and go shink and then it's off. You know, you, you can see the skin, you can see where, you know, the break is between this, uh, the actual hair and the mat. And it's all around, you know, just a little bit more easy, uh, in my opinion, that is. Mm -hmm. We actually, I'm sitting at my desk in my office right now. <laughs> and I found this in my grandmother's house when I was cleaning her house. And the blade is like right here. Mm -hmm. it, you can just go in and just go zip. And you can do that down on mats and it, it cuts right through it. And it's, I use it to open letters and to groom the dog. It's multi-purpose. <laughs> okay, that would also be great for the area underneath the, the ears to take that down through there and cut through some of that and, and make it easier to comb and get rid of some of that to keep their, the better circulation in their ears. So, we use box for the same reason too. So it's it's protected, but it's got a little blade in there. So especially those like little parts where you, you can't see well, you can just get it in there and then slice through the little mat without pulling a whole lot of hair out and without causing the do dog a lot of problems. So same thing as the letter opener, but 
and you can get a pack of like 20 of these for 10 bucks. That might even be easier because you're not using, it doesn't have the big tip on it like this, so. What are those again, Robin? This is just a box opener. Box opener, okay. Um, it, this particular one is called a Clever Cutter with K's. But it's just a box opener and you can get them at, uh, I think like Home Depot even, some uh, store like that or a hardware store in a package of like, I think there was 10 or 20, but it was a big package. I've never seen like just one. I do have an actual mat cutting tool that um, you can get for like $10 and it's L shaped with the, uh, so the handle is one end and then the blade is the other. But I like this even better than that. It's a lot safer and you can shove it into areas where you can't shove the other one. It's on Amazon pack, pack of a hundred, but I'm sure we can find a small, yep. You would not need a hundred. I don't need a hundred. I but think I, a great I idea. Thank 20, you. like uh, 14 years ago and I still probably have 10 brand new ones. So, Bev, uh, we talked about the lower bits of the dog, but what about the armpits and elbows? What would do you have any tricks of the trade for tackling those guys? Um, just breaking down the mats and combing it out. Yeah, I just did that actually. So, Bev, like you were saying, that technique to do the scissors, if uh -huh. they're really matted, if it's solid, uh, I just doing the scissor and then using a regular comb to get the rest out. Yeah, use use your scissors to comb down through the mats and then you can use the wide comb to comb it. And that'll break down the mats, it'll help pull out the mats and and maybe a little let more hair so you don't have the problem for next time. But if you're showing them, work the mats out if you're not just cut them out. How are we doing? Good. Anybody else have any questions at all? So we'll open it to just general questions and answers. So if anybody, if you have a question, feel free to unmute your microphone and ask away while we have Bev. Or if you're shy, you can put it in the chat and we'll ask it for you. <laughs> uh, I got a question. Oh, okay. Is it okay? Yes. I got a question concerning the 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 bat. Uh, how often usually you bat your dog, and what kind of shampoo do you use? Um, as long as I keep my coat, my undercoat, and I keep breaking it out three or four times a month, mm -hmm. um, I rarely bath my dogs. I'll bath their heads and their feet for a show, maybe. Um, but okay. I don't, I would, and you know, just because we're cold here. Um, yeah, I, I know. Bath them and leave them inside. <laughs> but um, I find rotating the coat, getting the undercoat out, uh, keeps them clean without smelling. I will bath, I will wash their blankets before I bath them. I just find they're, they're not okay. that smelly when you can maintain the undercoat from them. Uh, bathing them. I oh, wow. like crisp coat. I use a harder the terrier type shampoo for them. Um, okay. Uh, um, any of the other ones can just soften the coat and we don't want a softened coat. We want to keep our coats good and hard. Um, okay, does that answer so your question? A harsh coat shampoo. Chris yeah. Yes, thank you. Brand name of the shampoo. It's uh, I think by BioGroom maybe. Number uh, one systems. Systems. Yeah. So yeah, the, the brand yeah. is Crisp Coat. There are there are others out there, but some of them smell, and I'm not one for perfumes. There are uh, a lot of other companies. Just make sure when you're going to look for a shampoo for your dogs that it's a hard coat or a terrier type coat. That's the shampoo that you want. <laughs> And you want it to say, will not soften coat. That too. <laughs> All those products are on Amazon because I just looked at Marilyn's uh, eye wipes and the, 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 the cutter tools. They're all on Amazon. And I buy my crisp coat also on Amazon. 
I do too. The last time I bathed my coats, well, besides there were no dog shows, um, I haven't bathed my dogs in a long time. Maybe uh -huh. you don't want to come to my house either. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> This is this is what uh, I use, which I got from Joey. Okay. It's uh, that stuff is Isle, really. I love dogs. N thirty three, number thirty three. I've never heard of that one. I I it's use. To be, it's not non scented, and it's for terrier coats. Okay, as long as it's non scented, I'll try it. It's right. also very expensive, so yeah. I, like the all systems is about a hundredth of that cost. Oh. Wow. A uh, quick while we're while we're on that topic, uh, everybody uh, that are showing their products or talking about it, can we possibly add links to the products in the chat if you have them? Um, oh. The other thing is, Bev, uh, is there any truth to using baby shampoo? No, I I've never tried it. Um, I would think baby shampoo would soften the coat, mm -hmm. but I've never used it. So I can't answer. Yes. Have you used it? No. Okay. No. I, but I you, it, you, it does soften the coat. Okay. Uh, you, you've mentioned um, thinning shears and scissors. Are there some scissors or thinning shears better than others, like brands? What, um, where, do, where should we be looking for when buying these things? Um, there are several kinds of thinning shears. Oh, I, you know what? This, these scissors I got at a hairdressing, a human hairdressing uh, show. They would probably have your best quality and maybe your better prices. They're thinning shears. You can get the pet ones and they're serrated are wider. You want the narrower <laughs> ones as opposed to, I don't have the other ones are probably down in my box somewhere. You can get wider ones from a pet store. Those don't do very much. Again, a hair salon is probably one of your best places that you can get them. Okay. Your supply salon will have them. And there's there's a bunch of different kinds. There's like thinning shears, blending shears, chunkers. You just want to, uh, as it, I would say, as inexpensive as possible thinning shears. You want your teeth close together. Yes. You don't yeah. have and they still have to be sharp because you're just pulling, it's basically using to pull out undercoat. And you don't need a $500 pair of thinning shears for an otter hound. No. Because you can spend <laughs> $500. You don't need, you don't need a $500 pair. The only, the only um, more expensive, uh, they have a lot of different type of wire combs. I have a lot of different ones, but I like the Greyhound. You'll pay more for the Greyhound comb because where it's made, but to me, it is the best wire comb I have. I agree. And a comb like that costs about $15, $20. Typically you can spend 35 for one. You can also spend 135 too, but I think like within the $20 price range is, is a pretty good long lasting comb. Yeah. Okay, Pam, yes. The, how much in Canada? I don't know go to your pet store <laughs> I don't okay know. the greyhound okay yeah, the great the, yeah you're looking at 15 20 dollars for a greyhound or two okay. or three bucks for a regular wire one but uh, yeah I've got it, the greyhound works a lot better on removing that dead undercoat than any okay. other comb i've used and i've got a lot of wire ones you want me to send you some <laughs> <laughs> I, I have about four but I don't, I don't think i have a greyhound Okay, uh, and the Greyhound is a comb that's made, I think, in Germany. Ah. Okay. Cool. Where are we going? Oh, I'm going to go get my comb. Walking <laughs> around. Go <laughs> for a walk. There's my comb. Yeah, it's, it's not. I have that too, and you know what? I still like the Greyhound. Yeah. You want to see what I have in comb and wire combs? This is just a, a sample of them. And, oh, this one's got a wider tooth, so that would be good to comb them out before I attempt them with my Greyhound. But I don't like any of them. If you see me in the States and I make it to a show and you want one, come and grab one. Christine, you got a question. Well, 
it's not a question. It's just, um, I need to leave. But I just want to say, I am so delighted. I feel like I've got pages of notes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I am so excited and happy. I don't know whether my easy busy is going to be as equally happy tomorrow when I go. <laughs> But yeah, super, super happy. And it was it was nice to see other people coming up with the same sort of queries that I had. It made me feel like maybe I'm not so dumb. They're just a, a breed that you just don't know much about. I, I'm glad you came. Just remember, take your time. Don't think you have to do it all at once. And and when you pull out the top coats, the top tip, the top dead coats, you're only pulling maybe four or five hairs at a time. So it's not that stressful on the dog. And and do it in front of the TV or something. Have them cut I, know that is, I also do it when uh, in the morning. There you she go. Lies up, you know, what? the first okay. thing I see in the morning is her uh, staring into my eyes. And I have some scissors by the bed. If I find a mat, I just okay. stroke her and have Gone, gone. <laughs> I have a question. How many dogs lay in your lap? How many? Yeah, okay. Best time. They're all <laughs> cuddling up with you and you're just like pulling a few dog hairs here and there. And that's what I do too. <laughs> Best time. Okay, thanks. If, okay. I, if I do that, then he gets up and moves away. Yeah. <laughs> well, then you're pulling too much hair too fast. They well, I usually like that's when I start with the with the toes. Like I try to get him used to it, so I'll I'll okay. like play the feet. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks for coming, Christine. I'll send you the email. So before people leave, I just want to let you know that I will send everybody a uh, thank you for coming email along with the YouTube link to the video of this Otter Talk too. So if there's something that you want to refer back to, it's easy. Uh, most of the things we talked about today, I think all of them probably are available on Amazon. So I don't think we really need a whole bunch of links in there. And if you do have any questions, always feel free to reach out to Carmen or I or Bev directly. We're all happy to help. So just wanted to pass that information on before people started leaving. Thanks for doing this for us. Does, does anybody else have any questions at all for Bev? Yeah. Oh, I think she covered it all. Oh, yay. <laughs> um, Bev, I really want to thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for doing this. This is one of the Otter Talks that, that Carmen and I, when we first started in uh, late June of last year, this was one of the very first ones that we wanted to have. So I appreciate your generosity in sharing your knowledge with us. I knew that that there was a lot of demand for it and I'm happy that we had such a great attendance today. Um, so thank you from the bottom of my heart. I really, really, really do appreciate it. Um, and for everybody else that's on, um, feel free to join us for our upcoming Otter Talks. We don't have any um, on the actual calendar yet we have some coming up in march we're going to do a history of the breed and uh uh the standard it's a uh, akc presentation that becky von houten and eileen did for the akc we're going to have that divided up into two parts um that'll be in march we're just working on getting that scheduled right now and then we have a health otter talk coming up and we have an obedience and rally otter talk coming up and a confirmation of junior handling otter talk coming up. So all of those are on the schedule. So feel free to join us for any and all of those. We'll have them on the OHCA uh, groups IO calendar. We'll send out an email to our email list and then we'll also send an email out to the club members. And as always, all of these otter talks are available for every single buddy in the otter hound community. You do not have to be a member of the club to join. You can tell your friends about it, have them join along as well. So just a little plug for, for our future otter talks. Um, we have a lot of people saying thank you and uh, they appreciate it. And thank you, Beth, for all the information. Daryl says, this is my first time. Very informative. Thanks, Bev, and all. And terrific information. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and your a lot of, a lot of appreciation there. Uh, thank well, you. It was, it was fun. I enjoy, I enjoy sharing my knowledge.
And I'm very glad you did. And I'm glad you had fun with it. It's it's way more, it's way more, it's less stressful than it seems like sometimes in your head where some people are like, I don't want to do that. But then when they get started, they're like, that was a lot of fun. So oh, we're <laughs> sharing your beanie dogs. Oh yep. yeah. You like this one? Tell yeah. them that give them a big treat. Yeah. <laughs> sticks for everybody. I like yeah, I got yeah. We saved a bunch. Carmen, do you want any? Oh yeah, send it my way. <laughs>